Well, welcome to this month's QLI webinar series. This is Steve Kirschke. I have Zoe Devney with me in the studio. We have Laura Brown based in Denver. Laura, welcome and good morning. We are going to be talking about aphasia today. So breaking the silence, empowering people with aphasia to connect, engage, and thrive. So before we jump in, just a quick introduction of Zoe. Zoe is a speech language pathologist here at QLI. She oversees our aphasia program and is highly involved in all of our resident programs. And uh, it's been really fun to get to know you a little bit over this process and, and work on the aphasia program together. And I've seen this presentation already and uh, just really excited for you to be able to share it. I know you put a ton of work into it and have some really great stories. So we're excited to have you today. Oh, thank you. Uh, before we jump in, you, um, can you just advance the slides, Zoe? Before we jump into the presentation, again, just a quick overview of QLI. If you are familiar with QLI and our webinars, welcome back. We always love seeing repeat uh, folks joining us. If you're new to QLI, QLI is based in Omaha, Nebraska. We are a post-acute rehab facility. We also have an outpatient tele-rehab program, uh, but we specialize in uh, helping individuals with traumatic brain injury or stroke, as well as spinal cord injury, chronic pain, and limb loss get back to life. And uh, this is a picture of our campus. We sit on about 70 acres of uh, land here in Omaha, and we're just fortunate to partner with folks all around the country and have them come to Omaha and then transition them back into the real world. Uh, also quick housekeeping, uh, hopefully this is getting a bit repetitive at this point, but um, if you have questions, please use the Q&A. Laura and I will be monitoring that. Zoe, uh, as I mentioned in preparation, uh, if there's something relevant, we'll bring it up. If not, we can wait so we can navigate those. Okay. Uh, but we love having questions along the way, so please ask. Also to get your CEU, so please attend for um, you know, the entirety of the presentation. There will be one poll question at the end. We have a slide that will denote that. Um, it, it'll pop up, we'll, we'll cue you. You just have to answer that. Um, and uh, that's one piece of getting your CEUs. Um, upon clicking leave webinar, uh, you'll be also prompted to fill out a job form. Um, one quick note, if you have pop-ups disabled, sometimes this can be an issue. Just let us know if you have other issues, let us know. Uh, but once you submit that, you should receive an email automatically with your CEU certificate and the slides all combined. So you should get everything that you see today from Zoe um, in an email following up. Um, so with that, Zoe, let's, let's jump right in here. All right. Sounds great. Okay. So here's a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to go through understanding conversation in and of itself, and then what the differences between speech and language are. We're going to then deep dive into aphasia, both kind of starting broad with an overview, diving a little bit into some vocabulary that we use with aphasia, so go through some different case studies, talk about consequences of aphasia, and then leading lastly into rehabilitation strategies and approaches, including education and training, and hopefully leaving time for some questions at the end. Sounds good. Okay, so I just want to start with this quote. And I'm going to read it for everyone. It is far more important to know what person the disease has than what disease the person has. I think QLI does a really nice job of this in general, but I think especially for our individuals with aphasia, I just think about, you know, we, we really want to know who the person with aphasia is rather than specifically what about their aphasia, right? So we're, we're treating the person. So kind of breaking down conversation to start. Why do we have conversation? We engage in verbal language and conversation with each other every single day. And it is a means to interactions with others. We exchange information with one another. We express ourselves and, and develop our identity. And it's also just how we build relationships and camaraderie with one another. So there's a lot of different aspects of communication and in conversation. And so it's just incredibly vital that individuals with aphasia are still able to have these conversations. So what do we already know about conversation? A lot, right? We're all ex experts in conversation. We've been communicating essentially our whole lives. And these behaviors that we do are so innate because we've practiced them so many times. We have kind of a, a little 
the learning mantra here at QLI of repeat, repeat, repeat. So this doesn't happen overnight. Even when you're first developing language as an infant, it takes a lot of repetitions to learn the skills that we have now. And so when somebody has aphasia and they're experiencing these communication breakdowns, some of these behaviors we have to retrain and relearn. So the mm-hmmms that you do when somebody's talking to you, the head nodding, that's a behavior that you've learned over time. As I'm going through this webinar, I will probably make a few errors as I'm talking, but I'm gonna prefer to fix that myself, right? Steve's not gonna jump in and try to correct things for me. The other thing is that when we're talking and the message is understood, little errors tend to be ignored. And if the error is big enough to where maybe Steve isn't understanding what I'm saying, he's gonna ask me to clarify. So if that's the goal of our everyday conversation, why would we not also do that with people who have aphasia. And as just a quick reminder, these often are interchanged quite a bit. Um, there is a difference between speech and language. So with speech, it refers to the sounds that we produce to make different words. So all those different muscles. So for the purposes of this webinar, we're gonna be talking about aphasia, which is a language disorder. So language is uh, referring to the words that we use and how we use them. So it's all happening within the brain and it can include what words mean, how to add different endings to words or uh, different beginnings to words to make the different variations, and then how we put words together following the rules of a language. Kelsey, our other SLP, gives me a hard time and she's trained me not to just call you all speech therapists. <laughs> Yes. because the language is very, very important. I'm assuming you feel just the same way she does. So I've had to train yes. myself. So a little shout out to Kelsey and the, all the SLPs out there. We can't, she's, I think she says you, um, you can't just have speech. You also have to have the language. Yes, so. absolutely. Go Kelsey. Okay, so instead of me sitting here and talking at you and, and you just kind of hearing my voice and maybe seeing a few slides on what is aphasia, I'm gonna show you all a video it's a little bit longer, it's about five minutes, but I think it does a really nice job of, of presenting aphasia, providing some good examples, and then also gives you some, some videos to follow along visually. Language is an essential part of our lives that we often take for granted. With it, we can communicate our thoughts and feelings, lose ourselves in novels, send text messages, and greet friends. It's hard to imagine being unable to turn thoughts into words. But if the delicate web of language networks in your brain became disrupted by stroke, illness, or trauma, you could find yourself truly at a loss for words. This disorder, called aphasia, can impair all aspects of communication. People who have aphasia remain as intelligent as ever, they know what they want to say, but can't always get their words to come out correctly. They may unintentionally use substitutions called paraphasias, switching related words like saying dog for cat, or words that sound similar, such as house for horse. Sometimes their words may even be unrecognizable. There are several types of aphasia grouped into two categories, fluent or receptive aphasia and non-fluent or expressive aphasia. People with fluent aphasia may have normal vocal inflection, but use words that lack meaning. They have difficulty comprehending the speech of others and are frequently unable to recognize their own speech errors. People with non-fluent aphasia, on the other hand, may have good comprehension, but will experience long hesitations between words and make grammatical errors. We all have that tip of the tongue feeling from time to time when we can't think of a word. But having aphasia can make it hard to name simple everyday objects. Even reading and writing can be difficult and frustrating. So how does this language loss happen? The human brain has two hemispheres. In most people, the left hemisphere governs language. We know this because in 1861, the physician Paul Broca studied a patient who lost the ability to use all but a single word, tan. 
During a postmortem study of that patient's brain, Broca discovered a large lesion in the left hemisphere, now known as Broca's area. Scientists today believe that Broca's area is responsible in part for naming objects and coordinating the muscles involved in speech. Behind Broca's area is Wernicke's area, near the auditory cortex. That's where the brain attaches meaning to speech sounds. Damage to Wernicke's area impairs the brain's ability to comprehend language. Aphasia is caused by injury to one or both of these specialized language areas. Fortunately, there are other areas of the brain which support these language centers and can assist with communication. Even brain areas that control movement are connected to language. FMRI studies found that when we hear action words like run or dance, parts of the brain responsible for movement light up, as if the body was actually running or dancing. Our other hemisphere contributes to language too, enhancing the rhythm and intonation of our speech. These non-language areas sometimes assist people with aphasia when communication is difficult. So how common is aphasia? Approximately 1 million people in the U.S. alone have it, with an estimated 80,000 new cases per year. About one-third of stroke survivors suffer from aphasia, making it more prevalent than Parkinson's disease or multiple sclerosis, yet less widely known. There is one rare form of aphasia called primary progressive aphasia, or PPA, which is not caused by stroke or brain injury, but is actually a form of dementia in which language loss is the first symptom. The goal in treating PPA is to maintain language function for as long as possible, before other symptoms of dementia eventually occur. However, when aphasia is acquired from a stroke or brain trauma, language improvement may be achieved through speech therapy. Our brain's ability to repair itself, known as brain plasticity, permits areas surrounding a brain lesion to take over some functions during the recovery process. Scientists have been conducting experiments using new forms of technology, which they believe may encourage brain plasticity in people with aphasia. Meanwhile, many people with aphasia remain isolated, afraid that others won't understand them or give them extra time to speak. By offering them the time and flexibility to communicate in whatever way they can, you can help open the door to language again, moving beyond the limitations of aphasia. So that was that video on aphasia. I really like just all the differences that highlights and I think it paints a really nice picture of what aphasia is, but we're gonna do a little bit more of a deep dive. So kind of just going through this again, reviewing it a little bit, the brain anatomy used in language. Now, as the video stated, and just because we know the brain is such a complex organ, there are other areas also involved in language, but these are kind of the primary centers of language that we talk about. And when an individual comes to us, whether it's from stroke or traumatic brain injury, um, and typically the left side of their brain is affected in any of these areas, it's kind of a little bit of a red flag that Hey, they might have some, some communication difficulties, such as aphasia. And then just recapping these a little bit, um, there are two primary classifications of aphasia, one being non-fluent or expressive aphasia, and the other being fluent or receptive aphasia. So I'm not going to read through those bullets, but essentially with non-fluent aphasia, you can uh, infer typically that the expressive deficits are going to be greater than the receptive deficits and kind of vice versa for fluent aphasia, whereas the receptive deficits are often greater than the expressive deficits. So that kind of leads us into what we call the aphasia tree as speech therapist. Now see, I caught myself oh my saying God, language I, I know, I get someone to have it. Um, so as speech language pathologists, this is kind of how we classify different aphasias. So there are eight different kinds of aphasias listed there. Um, I do wanna make a quick caveat of that primary progressive aphasia is not in this realm of aphasia. As the video mentioned, it falls under the category of dementia. So while that has been in the news lately because of Bruce Willis and Wendy Williams, um, that's not our primary focus today. So looking at this aphasia tree, the first question that we have to ask ourselves as SLPs is, is there anomia, that word at the top, which really just is a fancy way of saying, is there difficulty finding words? 
If the answer is yes, then we kind of go into this aphasia tree. So I wanna bring your attention to the left side of the screen and those little starred bullets. This is not a perfect system. It's not set in stone and it's a spectrum in severity and type. So kind of walking through those, we look at, is the person fluent? Is their comprehension good or poor? And are they able to repeat? So it's not a perfect system in that nothing in this world is all yes or all no. So it kind of, it, it's a lot of evaluation, observation, talking with family, talking with the person with aphasia, and really determining the best classification for that person. I also wanna bring up that it's not set in stone. So just because somebody starts out with a diagnosis of global aphasia does not mean that they will always fall into that global aphasia category. There's also a spectrum within each different type of aphasia, right? So you could be um, anywhere from mild to um, severe, as far as severity goes. So somebody could have a really pretty mild Broca's aphasia, or they could have a, a more moderate to severe aphasia. Um, it just depends person to person. Also, just for our listeners too, you kind of referenced this, referenced this in the anatomy slide, but you know, aphasia can happen. I think a lot of times we we associate aphasia with stroke, but we see it with folks with um, acquired injuries as well. Can mm -hmm. you just kind of highlight that for some of our listeners? Some of our listeners maybe get exposed to this more so on the acquired side than than the from a CVA perspective. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, regardless of what caused the aphasia, we're always going to treat that person and their aphasia specifically. The I think the difficulty comes into with a stroke related aphasia. It's a little bit more clear cut because typically with stroke, you see more of an isolated area of the brain that's injured. Um, whereas when you go to traumatic brain injury, just because of the nature of the injury, you typically see a little bit more widespread damage and you can typically infer that there are gonna be other deficits kind of on top of this language disorder. So more cognitive deficits may be present, like maybe the area of their brain that is in, you know, in charge of attention is also injured. So that's gonna play a role mm -hmm. in how their aphasia presents. Cool. So diving into some vocabulary terms, I'm really just gonna talk about the top, well, three, but I've kind of already mentioned anomia is, is just that word finding difficulty. Paraphasia, as it mentioned in the video, it said that it's a substitution of different words. I also wanna bring up that a paraphasia can also be a substitution of a sound within a word. And I'll do a little bit more of a deep dive into paraphasias on the next slide. But the other term that I want to highlight is neologism. So this is a word that is not real to whatever language that you're speaking, in my case, English. So due to the language deficit, they are putting together different letters and sounds that don't follow the rules of our language. So that's kind of the essence of a neologism. Diving into paraphasias a little bit more. So this is kind of a breakdown of the different types of paraphasias. I'm really only going to talk about two or three of these just for time's sake. Um, the first one being a semantic paraphasia. So if the individual is trying to come up with the word tiger, right, they're thinking of a tiger in their mind and they're trying to get that word out. Sometimes it may come out as lion or panther or another related item, like a, a large cat would be. The other one that I want to highlight is a phonemic paraphasia. So in this case, instead of tiger coming out, it may sound like tiger. Instead of that B sound, that an F sound might come out instead. The other one that I wanted to highlight on here is called the circumlocution paraphasia, and that is essentially talking around the word. So this is actually kind of a strategy that we use sometimes in speech therapy when an individual can't get out the word that they want, but we might say, hey, can you describe it to me? And sometimes, you know, if somebody's talking to you and they're like, oh, it's that big cat with stripes that roars and it lives in the jungle, you would probably understand as a communication partner, oh, they're thinking of the word type. Mm -hmm. And you move on with the conversation. So before I dive into these case studies, I just want to um, highlight the bravery of the individuals that 
were willing to share videos of themselves speaking. These two individuals I have worked with, and one is actually on the webinar. He sent me a message, which is awesome. I'm super excited that he's on. Um, but I just really, really want to express my gratitude to both these individuals and also just protect their dignity in that this is a huge life-changing event that has happened and, and something that they're still working on to this day. Um, but I just wanted to make that very clear up front. So this is Jordan. He is a teacher and Jordan has a non-fluent aphasia and he also has a praxy of speech, but that is a whole different ball game that I'm not gonna get into for this webinar. Um, but I asked Jordan to send me a video once upon a time of him speaking to use for these presentations and his um, text response always gets me just the no sweat aphasia is my jam. This individual is the most positive individual I to this day have ever worked with. And he's amazing and he's made so much incredible progress. Um, but I, I had to throw that on there just to, to give you a little glimpse of Jordan's attitude. Um, but I'll go ahead and play his video and then I'll point out some things after. QLI family, hello! <laughs> and shout out to Zoe and Zoe! I have aphasia. My intelligence intact. That's a fact. My speech is getting better inch by inch. But the hard part to do every single day, practice, practice, practice. Group sessions on your my phone group sessions virtual and and um with me practice 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 every single day and hold on one more thing rest rest the key is rest. Hello, um, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Bye. So this is after Jordan was inpatient with us at QLI. He then came back for our intensive aphasia program and he sees Kelsey, the SLP that was mentioned earlier on continue our telerehab service uh, for speech language therapy sessions. And so Jordan has come such a long way. When he first came to QLI, he was getting maybe a few words out at a time, but you can see in that video, he is piecing together full mm -hmm. sentences, which is really, really exciting. And I think just shows, given the amount of repetitions that he's had and the amount of work that he's put in, you can see that progress with aphasia is absolutely possible. It takes a little bit longer because language is so complex and requires a lot of repetitions, but it's absolutely possible. And he is nowhere near done. I know Jordan very well. He's not, he's not stopping anytime soon. This next individual I'm going to refer to as Dr. Andrea. If you notice on the right side of your screen, you will see that this individual has her bachelor's, three master's degrees, and her doctor of education. So this is an incredibly brilliant woman who experienced a stroke and has a pretty significant aphasia resulting from that stroke. I wanna highlight that her intelligence is completely intact, but she just has this communication disorder that makes it really, really hard for her to get out her message. One of the things that you'll notice, and I probably should have highlighted earlier that I didn't really think of until just now, is when we think about language, we talk about the verbal expression, we talk about your auditory comprehension, and then we talk about reading and writing. So different language modalities are affected to different degrees for each person. For Andrea, she has really strong comprehension. The verbal expression is absolutely the hardest part for her. Reading is probably up there as well, 
but she has some really nice strengths in writing and drawing that we really tap into, as you can see on this slide. Andrea always has a notebook with her, if not a couple of notebooks with her, um, of previously written information, if in the moment she's trying to express herself. And so she utilizes these uh, pretty frequently. So I'm gonna show you this video first of Andrea and I, gosh, probably four or five months ago, maybe. September of um, 80, 21st, um, yes, mm -hmm. um, my stroke. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, February, no. January. Are you trying to do this one? No. That one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, my mother, um, my mom, my dad died mm -hmm. in February, March. Um, my mother died mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the same, um, so... Two years, no, one year, no, two years. A rough two years. Yeah, for yeah, sure. my mother and my dad mm -hmm. um, died. Um, so, um, because um, I'm, I'm brilliant, um, um, IQ is. 140. Yeah. You know your IQ. Yeah. I love that you know that. Yeah. I have no idea what my IQ is. Oh, yeah. Did you, like, I, take a test for it? No. I mean, yes. I oh. mean, um, um, get it. It's, it's, yeah. Where do you go? Um, 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 to, um, an I, IQ chest. <laughs> um, um, um. I, um, a long time ago, Creighton, 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 um, uh -huh. um, I, I, um, a long time ago, and then, um, Pakistan. So, so like, so you got it done when you were a student at Creighton? Yes, 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 yes. And then what about Pakistan? Yes, um. Pakistan IQ. You got one done there too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. How far apart were those? Oh, much. Um, twenty. Thirty years. Oh. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie. I don't know if I want to know my IQ. <laughs> I like. I'm curious. Yeah. But I know it's not close to 140. Yeah. So. No, 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 no. Okay. Um, so that was just a little glimpse of some interactions with Dr. Andrea. Um, a couple of things you may have noticed. She resorted to pointing to information that she had previously written down. And I took that as her communication. I carried on with the conversation that we were having. If I needed to clarify, I asked a clarifying question. Um, she had some paraphasias in there where maybe she said yes, and then she would self-correct and say, well, no, no. And then she would move on with the conversation. And at no point in that conversation did I say, okay, Andrea, you pointed to this. Now I want you to say it, right? So different means of communication, which I'll talk about a little bit later on, are all acceptable. And we had a full conversation about her IQ. And I, I stand by not particularly wanting to know mine. But <laughs> <laughs> um, this next video is Andrea before she had her stroke. And she was a little bit hesitant, and this was a very emotional journey to watch it back with her, and she was incredibly brave to allow me to share it um, on this platform as well. So you'll, you'll kind of see just the differences in her language and, and the speech that's coming out with her. 
Hey class, how are you? Been a long summer. I missed you. Actually, I actually have. I've missed, missed being with you and interacting. Um, again, my name is Andrea. I am the assistant principal for curriculum, instruction, and assessment at the American School Foundation of Monterrey in Mexico. I'm starting my second year here. We've had a lot of great successes with healthy grading reform discussions and um, looking at enabling personalized learning, which is actually my uh, topic of interest is creating personalized learning experiences, empowering students in uh, creating their own methods of assessment and um, empowering um, student agency in curriculum design. Okay, so she's very, like such an eloquent speaker, very articulate, a very intelligent woman. And a lot of that, unfortunately, is masked due to this communication disorder that we call aphasia. So all of that information is still in her brain. Her cognition is completely intact, but it's just getting the words back out is really hard. And it's frustrating mm -hmm. for individuals with aphasia. Yeah, so just to be clear, this is a pre-injury video, yes. right? Yes. And so, so, so the context is really just to say, these individuals are still very intelligent, very smart, mm -hmm. and the language and some of the deficits that we see can can cause us to misinterpret some of that or treat them in a certain way. Absolutely. Right? Yep. Aphasia masks competence. Absolutely. So yes, this is pre-injury. Going through kind of the outcomes of these two individuals, Jordan is back at home living independently, attending school in a modified teaching role Monday through Friday helping with basketball teams, but he still has aphasia. Andrea is at QLI on our long-term side of campus, living in assisted living, but she goes off campus and she attends events around all of QLI and off campus, but she still has aphasia. That, and that's just a piece that I want to be sure to highlight because even though individuals with aphasia make progress, aphasia is a chronic condition. So that's... A lot of hard conversations come from that, but I think it's really important to note that as well. But then also really provide that encouragement and that hope that QLI is so strong about providing that we can make progress. These individuals with aphasia will never stop making progress. They're going to keep going. We just, we need the time and we need the reps. Mm -hmm. So now that you kind of have the nuts and bolts of what is aphasia, now we're gonna go into why does it matter? So these two quotes, I mean, for me personally, just they really hit hit me in the heart and, and tug at my heartstrings. A survey of people living with aphasia revealed that more than 90% reported feeling socially isolated. And that was in 1988. Think of how connected we are now via social media, um, technology after an injury, whether it be stroke or traumatic brain injury, can be really difficult, let alone if you add an aphasia component where maybe reading and writing is harder. And then the other one states, results showed aphasia has the largest negative impact on quality of life, more than cancer and Alzheimer's disease. So that's really powerful, right? Because when you think of cancer and Alzheimer's disease, those are two diseases that you would never ever wish upon your worst enemy, right? And knowing that aphasia has more of a negative impact on quality of life is just heartbreaking to me. So I really have a bleeding heart for aphasia and I can go on a whole tangent, but I'll rein myself in. Um, <laughs> some other consequences that we'll deep dive into a little bit here are just changes to relationships, changes to identity, and then medical expenses. So breaking it down a little bit, this is from aphasia in North America, which is um, essentially a compilation of different studies that has been kind of worked and put together. But I just wanna highlight all these things that say higher cost of care, higher medical costs, loss of wages, cost to family and society, right? These are not things that we can take lightly. These are really impactful things that are gonna affect day-to-day -day life for somebody who has aphasia and people around them. And so these, um, these statements are more geared towards individuals with stroke. However, individuals who have aphasia with traumatic brain injury also 
you can likely infer that they would fall into a lot of these categories as well, just because that aphasia is still present. So the, in the aphasia cohort had more than twice the healthcare costs per person per year. The aphasia cohort had almost twice the rate of post-stroke physician visits per patient per year, higher rates of hospital readmission, may fail to understand and adhere to secondary prevention recommendations, and then the impacts of lost wages, productivity, and pain and suffering. So again, those are, those are really heavy things that you wouldn't wish on anyone. And individuals with aphasia experience these. Um, they experience them because if you think about not being able to tell your doctor where something hurts or the type of pain that you're experiencing, you're not able to ask questions about medications you're on or questions that you just have about your health in general, or if you have poor comprehension, not understanding what the doctors are saying to you, because I think we can all admit doctors don't typically have the best language all the time of, of explaining you know exactly what something is for. They use a lot of medical jargon. And for people with aphasia, that's significantly harder to understand. Mm -hmm. So now that I brought down the doom and gloom a little bit, let's raise it back up of what to do now. So we, as in speech language pathologists, we need you, but more importantly, the individuals with aphasia need you. So these individuals really benefit from a lot of repetition from support throughout their day-to-day -day life to really engage in, and have a better quality of life. So that kind of leads us into the life participation approach to aphasia, which is what we use here at QLI. It really falls in line with all of our um, mantras and just all of our different learning here. And this is not a treatment per se, but this is more so an approach to aphasia. Um, so looking at it and, and reflecting of this, the field of speech language pathology in general, for a long time in the field, we focused only on aphasia, only on the impairment. And while that absolutely has a part in aphasia rehabilitation, we also have to think about all the different areas of somebody's life that are affected by aphasia. So all of these different things you see on the screen here are impacted to some degree by aphasia. So we need to be training and rehabilitating and compensating all of these different areas. So diving into treatment and strategies a little bit, Oh, see, Kelsey would probably yell at me. I literally wrote a speech therapist on it. Gosh, it's terrible. So we don't need you to be speech language pathologists to make a difference and support someone with aphasia. You can do it without anything at all. The treatment that happens in speech, speech language sessions creates the strategies that need to be repeated. And this is where you come in as communication partners. Um, Everybody is obviously going to have different strengths and different areas of difficulty, but you know, there's not a, a one size fits all approach. However, that being said, the most important thing that you can do for somebody with aphasia is give wait time and allow for communication in whatever form that looks like. So from when I stopped talking to when that stopped moving, is the average amount of wait time that you need to provide somebody with aphasia to take in your message, understand what you said, generate a response, and figure out how they're gonna give that response back to you. That does not include the time that it takes for that person to actually express their message, whether it's verbally or written. That is purely just the time that they need to process that information and figure out how they're gonna to respond to it. As humans in conversation, and especially here in the United States, we have a very fast rate of interactions. We have a very fast rate of speech and we don't like to wait, right? Whenever there's a, a, a pause in conversation, we hate it so much that we've coined it awkward silence, <laughs> right? And there's nothing actually awkward about it. It's just there's space in the conversation. And so when you have somebody with aphasia who is really needing that wait time, it's going to make you a little bit uncomfortable as a communication partner because we're not used to it. That's why I always say it takes a lot of experience and just practice 
and knowing that it's not about you, right? It's about the person who has aphasia. So that wait time is incredibly vital. Just real quick, maybe what are some strategies that you might use just to combat being impatient? Um, because I do think that it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. And then it's also maybe a bit less natural because we are so used to going back and forth. So how do you do that in, in a therapy session? Or what are you doing to train some of the people that, that you work with? Practice. So I, this question comes up a lot of how long do I give them, right? A lot of times people want to jump in to try to help. They think it's helpful when they're jumping in, offering all these different options. But when you think about it, somebody with aphasia then has to process all the options you just gave them, try to figure out which one they want to respond to, how to generate that response, how are they going to get it out? It's really overwhelming. So honestly, it's a lot of practice. It's a lot of sit there, get comfortable with being uncomfortable, try it with individuals who don't have aphasia, right? So just in your everyday conversations, maybe you leave a little wait time. There are, there are plenty of times where I still catch myself jumping in more than I should. It's it's absolutely an art. It's mm -hmm. not a science, unfortunately. I wish I could say like, okay, once you count to five 1,000, mm -hmm. then you're good. But it's it's a lot of reading people's body language, right? You can typically tell when somebody's thinking about something, trying to generate something for you versus when maybe they've, they've kind of come to a roadblock. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So multimodal communication is the idea that any and all means of communication is acceptable and useful. And essentially, it's just using multiple means or multiple modes of communication. So that could include communication ramps, which are just behaviors and materials that allow um, the individual with aphasia to have communication success. So it could be visual materials, it could be verbal modifications by the communication partner, such as a slower rate of, spe of speech, but still keeping it age appropriate, um, repeating things, recapping what information has been presented, and then also nonverbal additions, so just using gestures. Um, it's funny that you asked that question on the last slide. There are plenty of times now where I'll be talking to people who don't have aphasia, and I'll be holding up, you know, <laughs> two fingers as I'm saying like oh it took me two minutes to do this today when normally you know and so it, it's funny as you get yourself just in the habit and in the practice of doing it you'll see it kind of pop up through day-to-day -day life you sound a little like me I'm a physical therapist so I have this weird um tendency to uh observe people's gait and try to figure out yeah. what's going on and you know you start to realize like oh that was maybe a little bit awkward I shouldn't say that yeah. out loud that I yeah. did that type of thing so yes, exactly um, so I am not, you know, any, not sponsored or anything with the Aphasia Institute, but I love this training that they have that's called Supported Conversation for Adults with Aphasia, or SCA. Um, it's a free training on their website. I have been going around to different teams at QLI and just having different teams do this training. It takes about an hour, hour and a half, um, and it just talks through aphasia. So it goes through acknowledging somebody's competence with aphasia, because like I mentioned, it's often masked, how you're going to help them reveal their own competence, and then just these different strategies. Um, one of the other things is we've printed off um, copies of this little toolkit and place them kind of all around QLI so that maybe somebody who's not as familiar communicating with someone with aphasia can refer to this and, and use some of these different strategies. Yeah, just a, also a plug, I did this training as well, and it, it is really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, you, you've you already done a little bit of this today, too, of, of modeling what it looks like to do all of these things. And so then you get this little bit of repetition, and then there's a practical component to it, right? So mm -hmm. going through it and, and practicing with other folks and um, really just getting used to it. You, you've referenced just getting comfortable and, and repetition, not only for the person on the receiving end, but the, the person who's supporting Right. And yeah, so um, I think this for, for our listeners who are maybe even familiar, I'm pretty familiar with aphasia and it was, this was really helpful mm -hmm. to me. Um, and, and I think it's applicable even for people who don't have aphasia. Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, how well are we doing, at, um, you know, clarifying did the topic get in and is it clear 
and you know how do we talk about things and so I think it can be really really helpful across the board. Um, I know you're getting here but just a plug we had a, a person ask um, is it uh, possible for a person with aphasia to construct a sentence using a series of pictures. I'm guessing you'll touch on this on yeah. uh, modes of communication, but just a little bit um, of a heads up there. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, funny enough, it's the next slide. <clears throat> Sorry, one more thing. We had a, also a question on where the training is available. Um, can you just really quickly do that? And then we'll also send it out um, after the fact. Yep, absolutely. So if you go to the Aphasia Institute website, um, there you have to create a profile. It's completely free. Um, but you'll just attach like an email and password to that. And if there's a section that is education and training, and um, you kind of have to hit a little drop down menu that says, I think, introduction to SCA, maybe. I'll have to double check, but it's just on their website um, and it's super accessible. And like I said, completely free. I'll try to put it in the chat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, kind of diving into our next thing, um, augmentative or alternative communication, or AAC. So when I say augmentative, it just means helping or supporting communication. Alternative is exactly what you'd think. It's it's kind of replacing somebody's communication or somebody's verbal communication, I should say. Um, we kind of break it down into three different categories of no tech, low tech, and high tech, or speech generating devices. Um, no tech is literally essentially just gestures. So um, different like blinking systems, like a thumbs up, thumbs down, waving at somebody. We use these in our everyday. Um, the next one is low tech. So a board with pictures or words, an alphabet board, pen and paper. So that visual I had of Andrea's notebook, um, that would be considered low tech, that AAC that she's using to help support her verbal expression. And then high tech and speech generating devices, I think obviously just with the state of the world and how we're moving with technology are, are really ramping up. I think probably the biggest one that we use here at QLI would be either an iPad or a phone, of some kind, um, and downloading an app. And essentially what you can do with these apps is you can upload different phrases. Maybe somebody has really good reading comprehension that they're able to select different phrases or piece together different buttons to create a full sentence. Um, sometimes we'll add pictures to help support somebody's reading comprehension, um, but absolutely just provides different ways for individuals to get their own message across without being dependent on somebody else. I put that training in the chat. So if you don't see it, um, someone if someone could respond um, and we'll get that sent out later. Okay, thank you. Then the last little piece here, is communication partner training. So Dr. Mara Silverman kind of coined the term communication support teams. This is essentially anybody who the individual with aphasia interacts with and communicates with in their day-to-day. -day. So it may be a spouse or a family member, somebody in the community, a friend, a coworker, a child, really anyone who that person is gonna need communication support from. And so this part is, essential for carryover because, you know, I can only do so much in seeing somebody for speech language sessions, but they're going to be going home for so many hours after that or going to work or out in the community or whatever that looks like. So it's being really intentional as SLPs to train those communication supports so that they're able to facilitate communication success for the individual with aphasia outside of these sessions as well. So the first step is kind of just identifying the who. So who makes sense for this individual to come in and train? Upfront, always providing education on aphasia of, gosh, this is a communication language disorder. This in and of itself does not affect their cognition. Now, little caveat with that is, like I mentioned earlier, if they have a traumatic brain injury, that maybe there, there might be some cognitive deficits present, but always just educate around aphasia too. Then excuse me, identifying the strategies that you found to be helpful in speech language sessions, such as, hey, can you describe that for me? I can tell, kind of guess where you're going, but I want you to see if you can get it. Or maybe that person prefers that you provide the word and they repeat it after you. So it's just kind of figuring out what strategies are gonna work for each person. 
and then training the strategy. So pulling in those communication supports into your speech language sessions with the individual they are present. So I think sometimes we try to do these one-on-ones with the supports and we leave out the person with aphasia, but that's not helpful to anyone because the real hands-on experience and the modeling that you can provide as a as an SLP is really valuable. Um, even if you have to record and reflect, you can have the individual with aphasia and the communication support record you know, an interaction or a conversation that they have at home bring it into your session the next day and say, okay, hey, this, like we had a communication breakdown. What are you saying here? What can we fix? I think you can also provide in the moment feedback and coaching. So maybe your 30 minute session is sitting down with the husband and wife and helping facilitate conversation and provide that coaching in the moment. <clears throat> and I think always a combination of all of these are, are great. Yeah, I think one of the things I've seen uh, with our team is just even the environment or the context that the training is occurring, right? I think it's pretty straightforward to have someone come into your aphasia treatment room Mm -hmm. and do these things. But um, where I think it's really uh, powerful is out and about, right? Whether it's on QLI's campus or at a restaurant or having to reorder your medications, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of contextual training that I think is missed. And the reality is you could train them in um, that four wall room, really structured setting, and they completely fail mm-hmm. outside mm-hmm. of that in a really similar task because there's factors that we haven't considered or haven't been able to train. So I don't Absolutely. know if you want to speak to that as well. Yeah, I mean, and you know, little asterisks of QLI being such a unique setting that we have the flexibility where we're able to go off of our campus and, and into the real world. Um, but just knowing that, like you mentioned, Steve, just the factors that you can't possibly simulate in the moment of, you know, gosh, like this is really structured. Your anxiety is really low because you've been in this room before. You're calm. Um, the language isn't being affected by emotions quite the way that maybe your anxiety plays into it out in the real world. Um, maybe somebody in the real world isn't as patient as your speech language pathologist that you've been working with is or your communication partner. Um, and so I think it, I, it's incredibly valuable to get out into the real world and actually do the things that they're going to be doing when they discharge whatever facility it is. Um, and just kind of help model because a lot of times too, communication supports, all good intent, will jump in and often speak for the person who has aphasia mm-hmm. because they want to protect their dignity. They think it's really helpful, but in reality, we want to give that person with aphasia as much independence as possible. So mm-hmm just even modeling, hey, we're going to sit back, they got this, mm-hmm. and, and providing that confidence to both the individual with aphasia and the supports. Yep. So it's just kind of a, a little wrap-up slide here. Um, you know, aphasia is a beast. Uh, that's kind of my phrase at this point. Um, but it's absolutely possible to see progress, and we do see a lot of incredible progress and just know that you know this training is for the people with aphasia. It's for the Casey's and the Oscars and the Georges and the Jordans and the Andreas and the Dons and the Ryans and the Amy's and the Sarah's and all those who are going to come after them. So um, thank you for for joining and and you know I'm this is my first webinar I've done so I'm open to feedback and. Uh, we have what five minutes for questions? Well, you Seven? did you did terrific. Um, thank so you. thank you for joining us. So uh, at this point, I'm going to launch the poll question. So a uh, quick reminder: this is the only poll question. Um, all you have to do is answer it, and this is step one in getting your CEU. So I'm going to go ahead and launch that. While I do this, so we do have some questions that we can go through. Uh, we do have a little bit of time, so I'll go ahead and launch. And um, that we just had an initial question about uh, SLP with dementia. Uh, is it, uh, the person was asking, did, did uh, she hear correctly that it can be beneficial with individuals with dementia? Yes, absolutely. It can be beneficial. Um, in the earlier stages of dementia, you're trying to rehab, obviously, as much as possible, um, just developing really, really good strategies, and then kind of slowly building in those compensatory strategies that are going to be needed later on um, and just having a really good plan set in place while their cognition is is more intact 
earlier on in the diagnosis um, and just setting up really good routines. Great. Another question. I think this is a little bit around, we have a couple questions around how do you correct someone or interact uh, with someone without being rude mm -hmm. in, in terms of the words that you say. So, you know, one question, is it frustrating for the patient to be corrected? And then how do you tell someone to give you a minute to gather their words without being rude? So can you talk a little bit about, you know, what, what are a couple of phrases you use um, yeah. in interacting with folks who need more time? Um, so, yeah. So I obviously can't speak for people with aphasia, but I think in working with people with aphasia, I've, I've seen the frustration that does happen when people are jumping in and trying to speak for them or trying to offer them options. Um, so I think absolutely the biggest thing you can do is give a lot of wait time. And one of the things that I am really, I, I always try to make a really conscientious effort of is my body language. A lot of times when somebody is trying to think of something, I'll be leaning in and, and that body language in and of itself is a little bit almost like threatening or it, it's maybe a little bit more anxiety raising. So I'll kind of just sit back in my chair, relax, cross my arms, take a drink of something if I have it nearby. Um, another thing I say is, take your time. I have time. Um, or I know, I know you know what you want to say. I'm going to give you the time. Let me know if you want help. And obviously it depends on each individual with aphasia, right? So just depending on how they best like feedback um, is always important to ask. And then also um, your relationship with that person too. So um, I think always ask that mm -hmm. people, it's such a, a strange concept, but sometimes it's just asking, how can I help you best communicate, right? As we don't do that in our day-to-day, -day, so it feels a little bit awkward, but it's absolutely okay. And I would honestly encourage it. Yeah. I don't know if this applies, but I think of even if you broaden it to individuals with some sort of catastrophic injury, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think of um, how we interact with, with our patients here. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I think people overcomplicate it and really treat them like a friend mm -hmm. or a coworker and have a normal conversation. They just might need some different strategies um, and finding a way to do that in a respectful way rather than you know, kind of a looking down way it is hard, right. but um, I tell folks who are unfamiliar, just treat them like a friend, a coworker, a family member, yep. and treat them like you would a normal adult. Exactly. And yeah. that gets you pretty far. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One of the things that is one of my personal pet peeves, and I'm sure probably a lot of people with phages pet peeves as well, is when the more childlike tones come out with a communication partner. Again, not bad intent, but it's just kind of a misunderstanding typically of, okay, maybe they're not understanding me, so I'm going to raise my voice and I'm going to, right, like we don't do that mm -hmm. in conversations with other adults. So just thinking of them as another adult mm -hmm. as they are yep. um, is, yeah, absolutely helpful. So we have more questions probably than we're going to get to, um, but how about return to work? I've even been thinking of mm -hmm. Jordan. He, he did return to work, correct? In a mock capacity, but yeah. So one of the questions is, what are some of the strategies um, that you've used to help people with that? Does it go back to just the education of maybe coworkers, of maybe a supervisor, um, narrowing down some strategies and providing a level of support? Is that a fair assumption? Is there anything yeah. else? Yeah, that... but it's definitely a loaded question. And again, depends on each individual. But um, yeah, doing a lot of um, really good conversations with the the workplace in and of itself, seeing if there is a modified option. And then as much as we can simulating the work tasks that they will be doing just to help try to generate some of that language that mm -hmm. is going to be involved in it. Yeah. Um last thing I think there's a, a you know a strategy around how do, how does the training work with the the partner, right? And I, and again with this one, I think there's what I've observed, there's a combination of you're doing it with the person in a really controlled environment of when you get back to work, here's some things we need to work on. Mm -hmm. And then also taking that training to the workplace, yep. right? Yep. However, that might happen, whether you go in person, our virtual uh, therapy has been a really nice asset in that regard, because it doesn't require you to get in a car mm -hmm. uh, and go there and you can do some virtual training with them. So uh, doing that right alongside them in the work environment, in, in a setting that is appropriate for them, right? It's mm -hmm. not too hard, not too easy. And we start to layer that on. Yeah, absolutely. And I think always involve the person with aphasia as much as you possibly can. Yeah. 
Well, you're getting a ton of shout outs here. So you've done an amazing job. Uh, thank thank you. you so much for your preparation. Uh, for those of you for questions we did not get to, uh, I will forward these to Zoe um, after the fact and, and we'll try to get those answered for you. Um, and uh, again, thank you for um, joining us today. Um, let's see if we can get to the next. Here's our contact information. Uh, if you need anything, obviously you can call me, email me, and I can get you to Zoe. Zoe was nice enough to, she didn't give her, give you her cell phone like <laughs> I did. So she's oh, probably a little nice. bit worried about you contacting her at 2 a.m. or something like that. But <laughs> um, you can email her, call her as well if you have specific questions. But as always, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate uh, everyone being a part of this. And we'll be back uh, next month with another presentation. Have a great day.